thank you everyone uh, for joining on, on such a beautiful day. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share my screen here and let me know if you can see it. A thumbs up, anybody? We good to go? Great. Okay, so this is uh, the title of this presentation is Transgressive Aesthetics When Children Curate the Classroom. On this presentation, I'm going to relate a story from my time as an elementary classroom teacher, where for 20 years, I taught third, fourth, and fifth grades in both public and private schools. This was prior to my entering into higher education, first as an instructor at Syracuse University, then as a clinical assistant professor at Fordham's Graduate School of Education at Lincoln Center in New York City, and presently <clears throat> as a tenure track assistant professor at Casanova College. Before beginning, I'm gonna invite you to write down any yes, but what about type questions you might have during this presentation. Uh, these will be addressed at the end. What you're going to see and what you are going to see in here will most likely be very different from your own educational experiences and lead to questions that ask how this level of creative, creative agency might impact student learning, classroom dynamics, or come into conflict with the status quo of schooling. My story begins a few years ago while walking through the galleries of the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, also known as Mass Mocha. I came upon an installation seen here by the artist Katerina Gross. Gross had used an industrial spray gun to paint expanses of garish colors across colossal styrofoam blocks and monumental mounds of dirt. Her colors also flowed effort effortlessly over the walls and pooled onto the floors. According to one art critic, Gross was able to reinvent the interior space as she created these immersive environments that melded painting with sculpture. Gross's show was also described as an installation that, quote, contaminates the blank space and its surrounding in a sudden release of Baroque energy. The more I wandered among the work, the more I became interested in Gross's ability to transform this massive gallery space in new and unexpected ways. The hulking styrofoam forms, pristine and white, propped up together atop enormous mounds of colored soil, envisioned an aurora borealis alighting on a surreal moonscape. As I continued to move through the space, I eventually found myself no longer looking at it as a work of art, but becoming part of the work of art. In one section, Gross sprayed a wide swath of bright greens and acidic yellows over a portion of an exit door. Suddenly I was reminded of the way my students would creatively interact with our classroom space using pencils, markers, and paint in a zealous attempt to leave their visual imprints on our walls, floors, doors, windows, and ceilings. <clears throat> Here's an image of my classroom where the students were allowed to curate the classroom, meaning they were allowed to choose how they wanted to interact with their learning space. The children alongside their teacher decided how they wanted to organize and store supplies, exhibit projects, and decorate the classroom in any way that best fit their learning needs, desires, and interests. I'm interested in educational theories and practices that focus on democratic classrooms, where children are given the agency to take ownership of their learning. This pedagogical approach allows the students to bring their interests into the classroom, have a say in how they go about their learning, and explore learning through various modes of creative expression. Of course, this educational perspective is not new. Educational philosopher John Dewey was an early proponent of democratic ideas in education. Additionally, independent schools such as those that follow the Reggio Emilia approach encourage their students to learn through doing rather than sitting at desks, listening to lectures, taking notes, and studying for final exams. Before continuing, I think it's important to contextualize this discussion by taking a moment to examine the ways in which elementary classrooms are generally conceived and idealized. I did this by searching the term elementary classroom on Google and randomly chose two photos from the first page. As you can see here, both rooms are well-appointed, colorful, and appear warm and inviting. <clears throat> However, what interests me is the idea that, although inviting, classrooms in general maintain highly, remain highly standardized learning environments with pre-established codes of conduct that leave little or no opportunities for students to add their decorative marks or bring their own aesthetic ideas to bear in a place where they spend a significant portion of the day. Classrooms are highly regulated and ritualized spaces. 
Even in bright, bright welcoming environments, as in the two examples presented here, it appears that the teacher has decided what items are displayed on the walls, hung from the ceiling and contained within the shelves and cabinets. We can look at these classrooms and get a good sense of where the children are allowed to sit, what spaces they are allowed to occupy, and the rules governing how they are allowed to move about and navigate the classroom space. It is also apparent where the students are required to focus their attention as they populate various portions of the classroom. These classrooms are familiar to us. We immediately recognize them as elementary classrooms because of how classrooms are portrayed in popular culture, presented in the media, and from our own experiences as students in similar looking educational environments when we were children. These classrooms are visually coded. For instance, we don't ask why the stars or flags are hung from the ceiling, rather we assume that they were placed there by the teacher as some sort of inspirational decoration. Similarly, we don't question why the alphabet written in cursive writing is prominently displayed in the front of the room, nor do we question how the desks are arranged, the bookshelves organized, or the many posters and items displayed on the walls. We simply accept it as an elementary classroom. Whereas in my classroom, it was difficult for an adult to read this type of classroom space, simply because it appeared unfamiliar and lacked the visual codes we are used to seeing in classrooms, elementary classrooms in particular. My classroom was by the children and for the children. The students were allowed to curate the classroom space according to their personal aesthetic. They took part in deciding such things as how the walls were decorated and how the furniture was used. I felt my role as a teacher was to provide a safe space where the children could enact their creative learning unimpeded by predetermined predetermined modes of curricular delivery or conventional schooling protocols and expectations. Here, the students had ownership of their schooling experiences such that they were allowed to adapt the classroom environment to best fit their comfort level and learning interests. Of course, this development in my classroom didn't happen overnight, but gradually over the course of many years. Various methodologies and practices emerged as I continued to research, explore, and experiment with the concepts of student agency, empowerment, choice and creative learning. According to one educational researcher, art constitutes one of the oldest forms of knowledge and knowing. Similarly, being immersed in a classroom environment curated by my students offered me as their teacher insights into how they went about their learning. This type of pedagogical approach began in the early years of my teaching career when I became fascinated with how the children went about their self-initiated creativity in schools. The self-initiated creations, as I call them, were usually made from the detritus children acquired from, our, from classroom floors while walking through the hallways, or when they had an opportunity to surreptitiously pilfer from a supply cabinet or teacher desk. I came to refer to these self-initiated creations as subterranean objects because of the way this children would go to great lengths to protect, protect their creations and hide them from the adults with whom they interacted in school spaces. I then decided to see what would happen if the children were given more latitude when making art in school, which led to my very first research question, what would happen if I allowed my students to bring their self-initiated creativity out in the open? What occurred was significant. Creative actions once invisible became visible as our classroom evoked the immersive environments found in the work of contemporary artist Katerina Gross, who created the colorful installations at the museum, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art that we saw on the previous slides. However, as Gross warned, what might be interesting to you might transgress somebody else's limits of acceptance. It seemed to me that one of the most obvious places to start in allowing my students to bring their self-initiated creativity out in the open was the whiteboard. As teachers, we are free to use the whiteboard to write messages, directives, and schedules, but the students need permission before they are allowed to make marks on the whiteboard or they are only allowed able to only able to access the whiteboard when they are called up to the front of the room to solve a problem. This practice positions the whiteboard as a sacrosanct, sacrosanct object delimited by expressions of academic rigor. Even the placement of these expansive pristine white surfaces at the front of at the front of classrooms signals an authoritative presence. presence. So I decided to see what would happen if my students were not required to ask permission to use the whiteboard. What would happen if they were allowed to access it anytime they wished for their own creative learning purposes? As expected, at the beginning of the school year, my students regarded the whiteboard as the sole domain of the teacher or the teachers as this was what they had come to expect from the previous schooling experiences thus far. 
Soon, however, there, they came to find that each member of our classroom community had equal access to the whiteboard. And it was agreed during class meetings that the students would be allowed to write or draw anything they wanted on the whiteboard, as long as it was not hurtful to others or was a distraction to anyone else's learning. The students ended up using the whiteboard as a communicative tool, a message center, a place to try out various graphic techniques, and a place to creatively and collaboratively interact by, text, by using textual and graphic markings. When I needed to use the whiteboard, I would simply erase an area and proceed with the lesson. As I continued to examine my classroom power structures, I began to examine every aspect of my classroom space. I considered objects that were under my control and off limits to students. <clears throat> For example, the filing cabinets, shelves, closets, whiteboards, doors, windowsills, and bulletin boards were all teacher controlled domains. Supplies including construction paper, pencils, glues, crayons, markers, paint, scissors, and poster boards were doled out and dispensed according to my schedules, timelines, and agendas. As the teacher, I was clearly the sole authority figure. I had jurisdiction over the classroom, both physically and psychologically. One day, I found in the back of a storage closet an unopened case of water-based markers. All that over the course of who knows how many years ended up drying out and becoming unusable. That's when I decided to allow my students free access to classroom materials. This method of allowing students ownership became a way for my students to learn how to be stewards of classroom supplies. For example, when we saw that the masking tape was being used up at a very fast rate after becoming a popular material to make wallets and supply totes or to mummify a pencil, we had a classroom discussion on whether or not the activity of fashioning these items was worth running out of masking tape before the end of the school year. The students decided that yes, it was. And by early February, as our masking tape supply became depleted, the students moved on to using other materials and supplies for the creative projects. When one student used an inordinate amount of glitter for a self-portrait, the others debated the value of a scintillating work of art compared to that of a 99 cent of jar of glitter. These situations brought up opportunities for discussions and debates as the children had to problem solve and find solutions, a role and responsibility that came with being a member of a democratic community of learners. <clears throat> as this practice of student agency enacted through choice-based self-initiated creativity grew during the regular learning day, I saw how it played out in every aspect of our day. In the past, like many other teachers, I required students to put away any type of material that I thought might distract them from their learning. I then allowed my students to decide what objects and materials they needed or desired, desired to have part of their learning activity. For example, as part of their preparation for math class, two of my students would set up their animal pencil top erasers in various grids or semicircles, which reminded me of a contemporary art installation. I wasn't sure why they did, did this, but I noticed how this ritualized act helped them settle in and concentrate on their math work. Next, I began to notice how the children reused their personal belongings as well as classroom snacks as part, of, as part of their creative explorations. Here we see how a student chose to decorate one of her folders, how others used their snacks as a creative medium, and how some decorated their lockers, something that the middle and high school students in our school were allowed to do, but not the elementary students and how another student uses locker as a storage space for his self-initiated creations. These creations seem fairly innocuous, yet when children engage in creativity in these ways, it does cause concern among some who interpret this as the students squandering school supplies or playing with and wasting food. Similarly, when students decide to explore self-marking and adorning themselves with accoutrements in the form of fake mustaches, beards and hand, wrist and facial decorations, along with witty masks, these type of creative, self-initiated creative engagements were largely seen by those outside our classroom as distraction from learning and misuse of materials. Homework papers are also very regulated interactive spaces. When children decide to mark, mark their homework in creative ways other than the ways in which they were, it was intended, their creations are not only devalued, but also viewed as the student not taking their schoolwork seriously or somehow being disrespectful toward their schoolwork. As previously mentioned, student bodies are also highly regulated in classroom spaces. Whereas when my students were allowed to position themselves in ways that best suited their learning needs, 
it was demonstrated how children will, will interact in various ways, but still be very much involved as a part of a classroom community of learners. This concept, concept of student agency extended beyond the classroom and even beyond the playground where our students were allowed to, <clears throat> excuse me, explore the wooded spaces that bordered the playground. And now I wanna go back to the image of my classroom to better explain what you are seeing in that photograph that I showed earlier during this presentation. So here's three detailed portions of the classroom that I'm going to explain and why it looked, how it came to look this way. So on the left, the climbing wall, when a handful of students overheard my teaching partner telling me about how we enjoy the sport of climbing, students asked if we could build a climbing wall for them in the classroom. Then in the center, when we had a class discussion and debate about children doodling on desks and marking the walls, it was decided through a class vote to allow the students to express themselves by marking the tables, walls, and even classroom window shades. And then on the right, when my teaching partner and I noticed that the students enjoyed sharing their learning via skits and other types of dramatic presentations, we built them a classroom stage, which they were then freely allowed to decorate and arrange according to their liking. Although this may look strange, and it even has been described by past administrators as messy and chaotic, every aspect of the classroom was purposeful, intentional, and emerged from the learning styles, desires, and creative needs of the students. <clears throat> 